Amen. Um, let us pray. Our Father and our God, we are so thankful and grateful for the opportunity of living yet another day, of being alive yet another day. This morning, we'd like to bring ourselves at the altar. And as you are going to talk to us now, may you, you head with you it's towards may you be the one speaking through the pastor and may you help him select words that are as effective as you would want them to be when all is said and done our prayer is that as families our names be found in the book of life in jesus name we pray amen, amen. Amen, amen, uh, the family of Lubanda. Thank you for taking us to the throne of grace this morning. Without further ado, I welcome you, my pastor, um, Pastor Poswa. The platform is yours as you talk to us this morning. Video. Um, I do not know if I, okay, now I can. Uh, you will forgive me. This morning I am in unfamiliar territory. As you can see, it looks a bit dark here. I'm in a different place, but uh, by God's grace, the word of God will still be heard. Amen. Amen. Yes, yes praise the Lord. Thank you, my sister. Um, let us turn in our Bibles to the book of Revelation. Um, we're still in Revelation chapter 14. And we are going to read once more there in verses 6 to 7. The Bible says, And I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel, to preach unto them that dwell on the earth, and to every nation, kindred, tongue, and people, saying with a loud voice, fear God and give glory to him for the hour of his judgment is come and worship him that made heaven and earth, the sea and the fountains of waters. May um, here we are hearing something else. We spoke about fearing God and giving glory to him yesterday morning. And this morning we are told why we are to fear God and give glory to him. The Bible says, for the hour of his judgment has come. The hour of his judgment has come. It is interesting when you are reading in the Bible, in the New Testament, for example, in the book of Acts, chapter 17 and verse 31, the Bible says, because he has set a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness through a man whom he has appointed, having furnished proof to all his people by raising him from the dead. So the Bible here is speaking about, it says, God has appointed a day in which he will judge the world. Now, if you notice, look with me in the same book, the book of Acts in chapter now 24 and verse 25. Chapter 24, verse 25. It's easy to remember this verse is just 24, 25. In verse 25 of Matthew uh, sorry, of the book of Acts, the Bible says, but as he was discussing righteousness, self-control, and judgment to come, Felix became frightened and responded, go away for now, and when I have an opportunity, I will summon you. Now, again, this was Acts 24, 25. I'm reading from the NASB, the 2020 version of the NASB. Now, here the Bible tells us very clearly, friends, that God has appointed a day in which he will judge the world. Now, that is future. Here it says, um, Paul was discussing, among other things with Felix, judgment 
to come. Again, this is pointing to the future. But in the book of Revelation, in Revelation 14, the Bible says, fear God, give glory to him for the hour of his judgment has come. Are we together, friends? Now, it is not coming. Uh, it is not future now. It has come. Now, the same time that is spoken of here in the book of Revelation, in chapter 14, the hour of his judgment is also um, referred to in the book of Daniel. If you go with me to the book of Daniel now, chapter 7. Daniel chapter 7. The Bible says in Daniel chapter 7, in starting from verse 9, I kept looking until thrones were set up and the ancient of days took his seat. His garment was white as snow and the hair of his head like pure wool. His throne was ablaze with flames. Its wheels were a burning fire. A river of fire was flowing and coming out from before him. Thousands thousands ministered unto him or were serving him. And millions upon millions were standing before him. The court convened and the books were open. Now, here it says the court convened in the, in, the, in, in the NASB. But if you look in the King James and the New King James, it says, um, it says the, 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 the judgment was set in the King James and the books were opened uh, together. Now, of course, a, a court sits for judgment. Um, so, so the Bible tells us very clearly here that a time of judgment had come here and the judgment was set and the books were open and 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 this is an investigative kind of judgment because books are being investigated and we know that these are actually this is actually a pre-advent judgment because here uh, Jesus the one likened to the son of man has not actually received uh, his kingdom how do I know look at verse 13 the bible says I kept looking in the night visions and behold with the clouds of heaven, one like a son of man coming. And he came up to the ancient of days and was presented before him. And to him was given dominion, honor, and kingdom so that all peoples, nations, and populations of all languages might serve him. So here, Jesus is going to receive his kingdom. But in the judgment that is mentioned prior to this, there is no kingdom that has yet been received by Jesus. So there is a judgment that takes place before Jesus receives actually his kingdom and comes the second time as now in his glory as king of kings and lord of lords. So friends, this is very important for us to notice here. So the Bible tells us that Fear God and give glory to him for the hour of his judgment is come. Now, in the book of Revelation, using the principle of re recapitulation uh, or repeating a repetition and enlargement, when a thought is given and, and, and then the thought or a vision is given, as we see here in the book of Revelation, the vision is given in, uh, in, a, in one symbol. And then in the next vision, the same information is relayed, but using different symbol and adding a bit more information. So after the revelation of the kingdoms that are coming through ravenous beasts, the book of Daniel chapter seven is followed by this judgment scene that is taking place before the ancient of days. I hope we are together friends. But then when we look at chapter eight, when the vision of the kingdoms is given through domestic animals or through do domestic beasts, specifically a ram, a he goat, and also a little horn. When these symbols are used to signify the kingdoms of the world, then that scene is actually followed by something else. It is followed by the, the, the statement about the cleansing of the sanctuary. Look with me, friends, if you look at chapter 14, chapter 8, sorry, verse 14, the Bible says, um, and he said unto me, for, for 2,300 evenings and mornings, then the sanctuary will be the sanctuary will be cleansed. So the Bible says, unto 2,300 days, then shall be shall the sanctuary 
be cleansed. So the work of judgment in chapter seven is related to or related to in chapter eight with the work of judgment. I mean, sorry, with the work of cleansing the sanctuary and the work of cleansing, cleansing the sanctuary in the earthly sanctuary was actually connected with the day of atonement, the day of atonement, the day in which the sins of the people were actually blotted out from the earthly sanctuary. Now, this is very important, the foundation that we have set up. So the Bible is telling us that just before the second coming of Christ, there would be a judgment that would take place and there would be an anti-typical day of atonement. And the Bible tells us that the people who are living at that time actually need to live, uh, especially not that people did not need to at the time or at any time prior to this, but the Bible speaks to us that we need to fear God and give glory to him because the hour of his judgment has come. We are living in a time of investigative judgment. We are living in a time when uh, the books of heaven are being investigated, friends. We are living in a time when Jesus is preparing to come soon. He needs to blot out our sins from before him, before he comes. And we need to be found ready, friends. We need to be found ready. Now, you will notice that in, in the 2300 days prophecy that is given here in the book of Daniel chapter 14, and chapter eight, verse 14, and 2300 days, the beginning date is not given, but the beginning date is given in chapter nine when the 490 days prophecy is being discussed, which is said to be cut off, or which is said to be cut off actually um, from this 2300 days prophecy by the, 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 the angel Gabriel. So the angel Gabriel here tells us that from the going forth of the decree to restore and to build Jerusalem um, will be 487 um, uh, days or 69 weeks, as he says. So, and then he talks about the final week that would take place, which in all is 490 days. But there he finishes us with the beginning date of this prophecy. And, 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 and according to, to, to chapter six and verse 14 of the book of Ezra, the decree to restore and build Jerusalem was a threefold decree given through Cyrus, through Darius, and also lastly, finally, and more completely through Artaxerxes Longimanus. Now, Artaxerxes Longimanus began to reign in 464 BC, and the seventh year of his reign was actually in 457 BC. And this 457 BC marks the beginning, not only of the 490 day prophecy, but of the 2300 day prophecy uh, that it is actually cut off from our together friends. And now if you calculate from 457, the date of the issuing of the decree by Artaxerxes Longimanas, um, 2300 days spans all the way to AD 1844. So friends, from the year 1844, a work has been going on in the heavenly courts, a work of investigative judgment that is coming prior to the second coming of Christ. The Bible tells us that we are to fear God and to give glory to him because the hour of his judgment has come. Now the Bible says in the book of, um, of Ecclesiastes, something very important that the wise man tells us after saying all is vanity. The Bible says in chapter 12 and verse 13 and 14, the conclusion when everything has been heard is fear God and keep his commandments. Why? Because this applies to every person. And in the King James, it says, this is the whole duty of man. For God will bring every act to judgment everything which is hidden, whether it is good or whether it is evil. So the Bible tells us 
that the conclusion of the matter of the wise man is that we have to fear God and keep his commandments because God will bring every act into judgment. God will judge us for every act and for every secret thing, whether it is good or whether it is evil. Now, if you notice, friends, this is interesting. The Bible tells us that we are saved by grace through faith. It is not of ourselves. It is the gift from God. It is not of works, lest any man should boast. This is what we read in the book of Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8 and 9. Now, the Bible also tells us, interestingly, that we are to be judged by our works, and it seems to be a contradiction. How can we be saved by grace through faith, and, but, but then judged by our works? You will read this all the way in the book of Revelation. The Bible says that the dead were judged out of the things that were written in the books according to their works. So the Bible is very consistent. Uh, Paul in, in, in 2 Corinthians also speaks about the, 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 the fact that God will actually judge us based on the things that we have done in the body. And Jesus said, uh, and James said, speak ye and so do as those that will be judged by the law of liberty. Jesus himself in the book of Matthew chapter 12 said a, a good man um, uh, out of a good treasure of his heart brings forth that which is good. And an evil man out of the evil treasure of his heart brings forth that which is evil for out of the abundance of the heart his mouth speaks so the, the and then jesus said that for every idle thing that a man speaks he shall give account therefore or thereof in the judgment so the bible makes it very clear friends that we are to be judged by our works now how can it happen that we are saved by grace through faith and that it is not of works, lest any man should boast, but then we turn around, we are judged by our works. Now, it is interesting that in Ephesians, where we are told that, um, that, 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 that we are saved by grace through faith, the same Bible, verse, Bible text in verse 10 says, for we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works. So friends, when we are saved by grace, through faith, we are created in Christ Jesus. We become new creatures in Christ Jesus. Yea, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. All things have passed away, and behold, all things have become new. When we are created in Christ Jesus, friends, we are created unto good works, or we are created for good works. So the new birth experience is to enable us to do good works. When we are born again, when we have experienced the new birth, the Bible tells us we become new creatures in Christ. The old things have passed away. The new things have come. The Bible tells us that we are created for good works. What does God do? do when we are born again. The Bible says, um, being justified by his grace, we have been made heirs according to the hope of eternal life. But before that, the Bible says, being justified by his grace, uh, sorry, before that, it says, um, by the washing of regeneration and the renewing of the Holy Ghost. So when we are justified, friends, God recreates us. God renews us through the Holy Spirit even in the book of Ezekiel, in the Old Testament, the Bible said, a new heart also will I give you, and a new spirit will I put within you, and I will take away the stony heart out of your flesh, and I will give you a heart of flesh, and I will put my spirit within you, and I will cause you to walk in my statutes, and you shall keep my judgments and do them. What are we hearing here, friends, is that when we receive the new birth experience, God takes away the stony heart out of our flesh, meaning this is a symbolic statement, of course, to say that God takes away the stubborn heart out of us. God takes away the heart that is in rebellion against his will. And what does God do? God implants in us a heart that is softened to his will, a heart that is malleable to his will, a heart that is willing to obey God. But God does not only give us um, the heart that is willing to, 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 obey, to, to, to obey him, but God puts his spirit within us and empowers us. This is what Ezekiel says when he says he causes us to walk in his statutes. He 
empowers us to live a life of obedience, friends. So when God gives us his Holy Spirit, now he has put a new heart in us, which means we have new desires, new aspirations, new uh, 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 new impulses, we are regenerated into the image of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Now, God does not only give us that willingness, that softness of heart, that willingness to obey him, but God enables us to obey him by giving us the Holy Spirit, who is none other than the third person of the Godhead, who, according to desire of ages, the chapter, it is finished, so, you know, comes with no modified energy, but with the fullness of divine power. And therefore, friends, as the Apostle Paul says, he says, um, uh, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who works in you, both to will and to do of his good pleasure. So friends, when we are born again, God does not only work in us to will, it is not only the willingness that God works in us, but it is the doing as well, so that we are not only willing to do what that, is, that which is right, but we are furnished with the equipment to actually do that which is right. And the highest power that can be given to man, the highest um, agency that can be given to man, the most powerful agency that can be given to man is given to us, which is the Holy Spirit. So God, through the Holy Spirit dwelling in us, works in us, not only the willingness to do his will, but also the capability to do his will. Oh, friends, this is a powerful message, friends, that we get from God, that we do not need to depend upon our feeble might. We do not need to depend upon our feeble strength. We do not need to depend upon the weakness of the flesh because Jesus said the spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. But what does God do to help the flesh that is weak? He furnishes us with the Holy Spirit so that we may be empowered to do that which we are incapable of doing without his power. Is there anything hard for the Lord? Is there anything difficult for the Lord? Are you weak? Are you feeble? Are you incapable of doing the will of God? God says, my grace is sufficient for you, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. So friends, yes, we are living in the hour of judgment, but God has furnished the power that we need in order to render obedience to him. We do not need to rely upon our own power. In the book, Christ's Audric Lessons, in page 333, we are told the heavenly agencies will work with those who with determined faith seek um, the perfection of character, which will reach out in perfection in action. To every soul that is engaged in this work, God says, I am at thy right hand to help you. Then she says these wonderful words. When the will of man cooperates with the will of God, it becomes omnipotent. Now, let me, let me repeat that in case you did not hear it. When the will of man cooperates with the will of God, it becomes omnipotent all powerful that is whatsoever is to be done at his command may be accomplished in his strength all his biddings are enablings friends this is how she ends this quote she says all his biddings are enablings meaning when god commands anything he enables you to do it when god said let there be light there was light when god says let the a green grass spring forth, it sprang forth. The word of God is invested with his divine power. Therefore, when he says, thou shalt not commit adultery, the power to carry that out is in that word. Every command is a promise and can be received. Yea and amen. May God bless us to understand that when we read the commands of God, they are not just commands, but they are promises from an all-powerful God. That is why before God gives the Ten Commandments, friends, 
And he says, I am the Lord your God who took you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. I have already shown you my power. I have already rained 10 plagues. I have already split the Red Sea. I have already rained manna for you from heaven. You know my power. Therefore, you shall have no other gods before me. By the means of the same power that took you out of Egypt, now you shall not have other gods before me. Now you shall not make unto you any graven image. So the power to carry out the command is the same power that God used to take you out of the miry clay and set your feet upon the rock. Yes, we are living in the time of judgment, friends, but we do not need to rely upon our own strength to stand in the judgment. Jesus is our judge. Paul says, God judges us by that man. It is Jesus who is our judge. The same one who is who, who died our sacrifice, the same one who is our advocate is also our judge. All heaven is on our side in this judgment. And we need not to fear the judgment, but we are to submit ourselves fully to God and receive fully of his promises and of his power and of all the package that he has given us to live victorious lives. May that be our experience. Let us pray, Father in heaven. Thank you for furnishing us with all the means that we need in order to live godly lives. Indeed, what is spoken of by the apostle Peter when he says, you have given us all things that pertain unto life and godliness. It is true, Lord, we have seen it. Thank you for the Holy Spirit. Thank you for the third person of the Godhead. Thank you, Lord, for giving us the power of omnipotence to carry out your commands. Thank you that your commands are not just commands, but they are promises to us. Help us to receive them by faith and for them to be lived out in our experience. It is in Jesus' name that we pray and thank you. Amen.